My name is Rose Amador LeBeau. I am President and CEO of the Center for Training and Career, CTC. Our mission is to help people through employment and education become self-sufficient. We have a day worker center. We have educational programs so people can get their GEDs. We serve a variety of people, people who've just become unemployed, people who have never worked. We work with homeless people. We work with people who have just gotten out of prison and have to re-enter the workforce. So we're full service. Now we have our own facility, and so it enables us to expand programs in response to the needs of the community. I think it's seeing people make the change, become successful, uh, make that transition, and actually having an impact on people's lives, a positive impact. To see these success stories is what it's all about. Good evening, welcome to another edition of Native Voice TV. I'm Sundas Martinez. And I'm Siwapili Rose Amador, and together we are Native Voice TV. We are the indigenous people. Yes, we are. Well, I have the pleasure of introducing William Underbaggage, who is of the Lakota Nation. And William carries or wears a lot of hats. Can you tell us about some of them? Well, First of all, I'm the founder and executive director of Indigenous Nations Network, which we founded in 1999, right at the end of 99 into 2000, as we discussed many issues across Indigenous land, Native America, and how the word was not getting out to our communities. The mainstream media was not covering a lot of the issues when they did. It was about the violence and the negative things that portrayed Native America. Indigenous America, so we created Indigenous Nations Network to focus on issues of politics, religion, uh, Indigenous rights, and culture. And you wow. also have the, is this part of it, the Lakota Mexica Exchange that you talked to us before about it when you came on the show? Yes. Uh, one of the things that I realized as I traveled across this continent, uh, I traveled to Mexico to participate in ceremonies with transferred from my people to Mexico, one mainly the Sundance and some of what we call the Inipi or the sweat lodges that it's better known by. And a lot of the Mexi Me Mexicano people were coming up to the United States to dance and participate in the ceremonies with us. And in 1992, after the Peace and Dignities journey, some of us were invited to Mexico to bring the ceremonies back to Mexico. And out of that, we created something we call La Cota Mexica Cultural Exchange as we realized uh, indigenous peoples need to share cultures mm -hmm. amongst each other, not necessarily run off to other countries to, to show them what we're about, that we need to explore each other and identify with each, with each other. As, as many people say, the borders, uh, we didn't cross the borders, the borders crossed us. And we took that to heart and started bringing many, many cultural exchanges into, into our communities, local communities, such as San Jose. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, of sovereign nations that I've never heard of prior to starting this show, and we've heard so many things about all these different sovereign nations, and, and it's really important that the public and, and everyone else is aware of this, you know. Now, you travel throughout the nation or throughout the world, and um, you, we happen to bring you on the show because you happen to be in San Jose, and we're very pleased that we were able to bring you on. And you were at a, a walk yesterday at a march. Tell us about that march. Well, first of all, the march was, is an anti-war march. But the reason I became very involved in the anti-war movement is because back in 19, uh, 19 or 2001, uh, I was in New York City when the World Trade Centers were hit. I was in Manhattan and I seen what happened there. And I seen how the reactionary, reaction, 
of a part on the part of our government blamed certain peoples and I didn't like the idea that we had to support a war that was totally wrong and yes there was things that need to be done but we have to realize that our present administration was in cohorts with the bin Laden family the, the house of Saud Saudi Arabia and the more we realized and the more we thought about it we said wait a minute this seems to be a cover-up and mm -hmm. so I started doing a lot of anti-war uh, work mainly because I am Lakota I suffered an attempt of genocide on my people at Wounded Knee mm -hmm. and again in 1973 so I stood up and, and my grandfather basically told me that I have to use my voice and to try to create peace amongst peoples so that's what I do now I travel travel the world talking about peace and not necessarily the world the uh, turtle, uh, turtle island as we call it and the biggest reason I did did that is because uh, when we pray in our ceremonies we pray about peace when we have something called a peace pipe which is called a sacred pipe and and I carry one of those mm -hmm. and so I'm supposed to continuously do that as one of my uncles said you cannot carry a rifle in one hand and a sacred pipe in the other huh. so in that manner I've been doing that ever since I was young actually and uh, the the biggest impetus of me doing a lot of the work is when I pray I pray for a lot of people I was asked to pray for representative Barbara Lee uh, we did a thank you ceremony for her in Oakland right after the war started and I was asked to do the opening prayer for her so in that sense I was able to affect a lot more people and reach a lot more people because Barbara Lee was the only person to vote against the war and it wasn't just that she was a person but that she was a black woman why did it take a black woman to vote against this war and why did nobody support her so we did a thank you uh, gathering for her in Oakland yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. yeah a lot of people prior to the 9-11 thing didn't know much about uh, the bin Laden family or the Bush family being in business together but uh, they in fact they have that Unical pipeline and they've been making billions and billions of dollars together and um, you people know people seem to ignore that yeah people they? yeah ignore that and you know prior you know right after the uh, the planes hit you know they flew the bin Laden family out of here yes yeah. And it brings me to the next point. Uh, this, this march that we did yesterday, uh, there was a man named Fern Fernando Suarez del Solar that lost a son at the beginning of the war. And ever since then, he's felt this intense anguish and pain about losing a son mm -hmm. to this needless and senseless war where a lot of the people in the front lines are people of color, Latinos, Chicanos, indigenous, black, and and again a lot of poor white white folks too so it's yeah. just a matter of that the that this administration is exploiting these young people and making them think that they're heroes and brings me <coughs> to the next point is uh i personally lost a family member to this needless and unjust war and i have a picture that i carried on the march of my nephew his name is brett lundstrom he died in in Fallujah on January 7th of this year so we just sent him on a spirit journey uh, right after that a week after that they brought his body back and uh, and the saddest part about it is my sister only has two boys mm -hmm. and they're both in the military he, uh, Brett was in the Marines and he's got a younger brother named Edward Lundstrom jr. that is an army and, uh, and he he had to go back to Iraq a few days after 10 days after he buried mm -hmm. his older brother and he looks so, we, so young himself right he was there, 22 years picture. old oh. wow 22 years old and this is the best and the brightest mm -hmm. and one thing that the bush administration is exploiting a lot is these young children that are fed images of heroes to say that they're heroes to me a hero is a live one mm -hmm. to me a dead hero does no good to this world especially a young person that had so much promise i will never meet his children i will never mm -hmm. meet his grandchildren so that was my biggest impetus and it makes my vo voice stronger when I'm doing a lot of this uh, anti-war work and part of the reason I joined the, the, <coughs> the Latino Peace March the Latino community says no to the war and again it's a, it was a peace march that left San Diego a few weeks ago a couple weeks ago and they walked all, across, all the way across California went to Cesar Chavez's gravesite in La Paz California and then they came all the way across and they came to San Jose 
and this is the closest I could get to walk with them. So we walked yesterday around the San Jose neighborhoods, East San Jose. We walked around, we started off at the Mexican Heritage Plaza and we ended up going to a army recruiting station. Of course, it was Sunday and they were closed, mm -hmm. but we still made the attempt to go there and let these people know that they should not be recruiting in our neighborhoods, in the poor neighborhoods where economically these young people have no advantages, uh, such as going to college or higher education, and these recruiters exploit that. Yeah. They and do, they trick them and yes. make yeah. promises. Especially, that. Yeah, especially among Native people back in the Second World War, Vietnam War, they were taking 80, 70, 90 percent of all eligible men, you know, in one nation. And that's, that's criminal because yes. that's, that's too much. That's genocide. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. genocide. And, you know, and they're being put up front in the front lines to be the first one to fight. And what yeah. I don't like about that is because in the past our people were warriors mm. and they exploit that telling our people that oh yes you people are warriors you defend your land you do this and do that but yet America still does not like us America still has a very racist attitude towards, towards native peoples mm. and this is something that we are constantly working against to educate white America to understand that this land the majority of the people that still live on this land are indigenous peoples. Yeah. And we still, at the, at, at the very uh, high rate, a lot of the people of color are in the military because of economic reasons. Yeah, there's an illusion of freedom, but um, I believe that we started out as a true freedom, the, the original freedom fighters of this land, and we still are fighting this freedom fight. You know, and um, you know, our, our definition of freedom is totally different from the rest of the mainstream of America has. Well, I, lo I look at the term freedom. It came from a Latin term, yeah. libre dominio, the free domination. Mm -hmm. So there was part of that th that was left out. Freedom, it meant the freedom to dominate us. Mm -hmm. So I look at it that way, the free mm -hmm. domination of this government, what it has done to many, many people across this continent. Mm -hmm. And which brings me to the next point. Uh, I am very involved. Indigenous Nations Network is very involved. We are a recognized indigenous people's organization at the UN level. And I brought a bit of a, a video that we just produced and a friend of mine, Rebecca Summer of the Society for Threatened Peoples, which brought me into the UN. Uh, for, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, that's what I had to go under. Uh, a lot of the NGOs that represent us or supposedly represent us sometimes don't allow us in there because then we're, ta we're taking their funding away from them. So they don't allow us, they close the doors to us. So I had an organization from Germany called Society for Threatened Peoples that allowed me in under their NGO. And I, I was able to achieve the status of an indigenous people's organization through a whole other organization. So I, I brought a DVD that uh, we recently produced last year actually that kind of gives an overview and I just wanted to show a little bit about what it, what it entails. It's called a Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, which started in May of 2002 at the end of what's called a uh, Decade of Indigenous Peoples. There was a draft declaration that was made. Now, it's only a declaration. It has no legal meaning or no legal basis, but a declaration is just that. At least we declare that we do not like the oppression that we've been living under. And again, the United States is one of the countries that did not want to sign on to this draft declaration. And so it's very sad that other nations across the world have recognized indigenous peoples with living within their borders. Canada has an indigenous representative. Mexico has an indigenous representative at the UN. And yet the United, United States, States will not doesn't. allow us. They will not even recognize that we have mm -hmm. sovereign nations that are still viable today. Right. Yeah. Let's take a look at that. que nos dice que somos como unos animales salvajes, somos perros para ellos, pero lo que ellos no desconocen a nosotros, que nosotros somos un pueblo con idioma propio y conocimiento propio, lo que no conocen la demás, eh, la otra cultura, es que no valoriza nuestra cultura. Por lo tanto, nosotros, las mujeres indígenas, tenemos el valor principal para decirle a ellos también como nosotros nos unimos para proteger nuestro territorio, nuestra tierra, nuestro pájaro, nuestro árbol y nuestro río, entonces nosotros somos como la madre tierra. 
tahu tu ma, tahu tu ma, tahu tu ma si ke kasabah ya kore. In this vein, I endorse the inclusion of the indigenous issues among the priorities of the United Nations. De tener acceso a la educación, acceso al trabajo, que tengan tierra, que sea equitativo, que ya no haya exclusión. When the land is take of us, it's our life, it's our, our blood. Wow. And th it's that entire video. video, how long is that? This video is uh, 35 minutes, no, 55 minutes. Uh -huh. And we actually had it at two hours, but again, it was uh, funded by the UN. Mm -hmm. As you can see up in the corner, it, was, right. it has a UN logo on it. So the UN actually still is very uh, resistant to showing a lot of the footage that we actually had because there were some very violent scenes depicting what indigenous peoples are suffering. And so we had to take a lot of footage out, a lot of scenes out. Of course, they didn't want to see these things that happened to us, and they didn't want the world to know that these things are happening to us. So we shortened it down to 55 minutes, but we still have the original version that we produced uh, that is still out there. But again, the UN logo isn't on that one. So this is what's, this video that we have basically is meant for non-governmental organizations and heads of states of all these countries that comprise the UN. So it's, it was produced to educate people that represent the UN. How was it received? What's the reaction of the other countries? Well, so far we, re we released it last year, uh, almost a year ago. So the reaction has been very positive because, the, because of the fact that we use a lot of truth mm -hmm. and we use a lot of images. It was a collective video that was submitted by many people across the world that we were very, very proud to be associated with because some of these indigenous peoples come from regions in the world with what we called non-contacted people, uncontacted people that came and shared their stories and shared many, many, many pieces of uh, film that they brought to us. And so we were able to pull piece together many, many. So each of the clips that you've seen are probably about one, one second each, which meant that we have a lot more. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing that if these injustices were, you know, like the United States has gone to other countries to save these people and other people, but now these injustices are happening in the Americas, you know, North America, South America, but, the, you know, no one's help, coming to help us, you know. No, no. Well, they hide it. Yeah, they, they hide, do it. hide it. Well, mm -hmm. They do hide it. And so there, there again, some, something that happens to us is that these three countries that we live in, we still speak foreign languages. Yeah. Here in the United States, we speak English. In Mexico and further south, they speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And in Canada, they speak French. Yeah. And yet, some of our languages are very viable. This is what creates a culture, and this is what holds a culture to the, together, is our languages. So we know yeah. that. But also, what happens is we get our relatives, the trees cut down. When any documents come up like this, there's immense amounts of documents, and maybe sometimes 20-some languages that each document comes with a language. Mm -hmm. So we get these huge amounts of paper. And this mm -hmm. itself is uh, part of what's called the Permanent Council and Organization of American States. This is the actual, the, the actual draft declaration, but it's the American version. Mm -hmm. There's three versions. There's the, there's the UN version, the American version, and what's called the, the, uh, the indigenous version, mm -hmm. where people from Central South America have come together to create a document that really addresses many of the issues that are, are affecting us today. And yet, the American version and the United States is, is the main roadblock to this. They actually say they will not be a signatory to this document because they do not want to accept that they've done these horrific injustices to yeah. indigenous peoples here. 
I think it, it's it's important that all indigenous people in this land here get together and come together and try to support one another because that's about the only way it's going to happen. I mean, we can't forget our brothers any you know here or there, and they're not they're trying to you know I know in South America they're trying to to fight for indigenous rights, but then when they're doing that, they're also fighting for our rights as well. Yes, and they actually have a stronger voice in South America because they have a more unified voice mm -hmm. within all the countries. But one of the things that was a sticking point to a lot of this uh, discussion was who is considered indigenous? And I just want to read a, a little bit of, per, of a paragraph of, as to what the indigenous people came up with okay. and the United Nations came with. It says, who is indigenous? Who decides? The question of who is or is not an indigenous group has been difficult to address. There are some countries that say they have no indigenous peoples living within their borders, while groups of people living in those countries who have distinct languages and culture consider themselves indigenous to the lands on which they live and are actively seeking to protect their cultures and their right to their lands and resources. A description of indigenous peoples found in a study by Special Rapporteur Jose Martinez Cobo is often cited. It is sometimes erroneously referred to as the United Nations definition, but in practice the United Nations asks whether indigenous groups identify themselves as such. So what we look at is if you consider yourself indigenous, who am I to say you're not? And who am I to say which degree? Mm -hmm. So in Mexico, I heard a term. If you have a drop of indigenous blood, you are. And that's what I go by. When, I, when, I, when people ask me, how do you know who is? And I just ask them, well, if you consider yourself indigenous, if you consider yourself indigenous, then I, I can't question you. Mm -hmm. But yet this government sees fit to classify people as Mixed percentages, assigned numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to rely on, on a Zionist uh, system to, to identify us as being indigenous. Yeah. And uh, I guess yeah. down to the last point uh, is that we have many, many people. Again, we are not part of the mainstream media. We are basically very grassroots. We are very, very tied into our communities. And we are, are be becoming a worldwide organization. Indigenous Nations Network is now represented at the UN where a lot of people are recognizing that we have to speak for ourselves. We have to bring these informations when we go to these meetings such as the UN or the mm -hmm. Organization of American States and sit in on these meetings. Mainstream media does not cover it. Mainstream media will not bring it to my community in South Dakota. And instead they will show a clip and say, this is what the savages are doing today. Round the wagons, round, round up the mm. wagon trains, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a sad situation yeah. in 2006 where indigenous people are still being massacred today as we speak. Somewhere in this land right now, that's there right. is somebody being killed. And that's why I stand up and use my voice in that sense. And I actually have brought a couple more videos that we weren't are not able to share. But this is one that I, I'm an advisor on and I've actually do a lot of narration on it. And what, what, what this touches on is the struggles across indigenous America. And not only that, we touch on a little bit of the Maori in New Zealand mm -hmm. and other indigenous organizations that are having issues with their own uh, countries. The struggle in America, in America's the American empire against indigenous nations really puts the truth down to a lot of the issues that need to be uncovered. And one that is uh, that I'm really proud to be uh, a holder of a copy of this is called A Tattoo on My Heart, which touches on a subject and it actually investigates into the subject about what happened at Wounded Knee in 1973 and the story that came out of that. And that was never, never covered in any of the mainstream media. And then once again, some of these issues are never brought up in the mainstream press. So a lot of people have to actually get together and sit down and start creating these types of images for our youth, because the youth need to know the history of, of, of what we are going through, the struggles that we are, are involved in today. Absolutely. Yes. I want to thank you for all of your work. I want you to know that this is a voice for Native people, so we want to welcome you to come anytime you're in the area so you can keep us up to date on all the work you're doing in the communities all over the nation, and we really appreciate yeah. your work. Also, um, our condolences for your loss. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, my sister is really taking it hard and, because she's still got a son there. Mm -hmm. oh, it's difficult. So we'll send some prayers out there to protect them. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being here. We have a few announcements, and let's quickly go through those. The Native TANF program is open and open for business on 490 North 1st Street in San Jose. You can give them a call 
at the number on the screen. <coughs> There okay, woman's empowered to move ahead, move which ahead. is the WEMA program offered by the Center for Training and Careers. It's a non traditional training program for women, and uh, they have orientation every Monday at 10 a.m. at 1600 Las Plumas Avenue in San Jose. You can call 251 3165 for more information on that particular program. And next we have. Tune in to Indian Time Radio, KKUP 91.5 FM. That's every Tuesday, 8 to, 8 to 10 p.m. with Jack Hyatt and David Romero.